Induction. The Agency Files. A prequel. Written by Shatona Havig. Narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 1. Rockland, June 27, 2012, 10.52 a.m. He'd dodged bullets, literal ones, for years and without flinching. Much. So why did a stupid interview to secure his next career path daunt him? After staring at the nondescript building from the sidewalk, Keith Auger inhaled, held it, exhaled slowly, and took the steps at a swift but steady pace. No one would have noticed the half-second hesitation before he gripped the metal door handle and jerked it open. But he felt it and promised himself a stern talking to about it. Later, a bored receptionist took his name, clattered her ridiculously long fingernails over a keyboard, and reached for a card which she encoded with something. ID? Only then did she look up at him. Her attitude shifted just a little as he passed her his driver's license. Thank you, Mr. Auger. Down the hall to your left. Would you like me to show you? Women liked him. They always had. He didn't know if it was due to the obvious military training— the way he didn't flirt with them, or if he was as good-looking as they seemed to think. He'd never taken the time to examine himself, call him a coward, and he knew he was in this area, but he didn't want to decide that he came up wanting. I think I've got it, but if I find out I'm wrong, I'll be back. The woman's expression changed, and only then did he realize she'd gone from frustrated to hopeful. The hopeful was obvious. Frustrated, it could have been terrified. She had a difficult face to read. Well, I'll be here if you need anything. Keith chose not to reflect on whether the emphasis he thought he heard on anything was really there. You're an attractive woman, but the more you speak, the quicker it fades. He would have added, kill the desperation, but he stopped himself in time. He had no right to make that judgment. His shoes created light echoes across the tile flooring as he crossed the sterile lobby. Fake plants, black and white photos of Rockland landmarks, lots of grays and that weird color that always seemed to be fighting within itself over whether it was gray or brown. It couldn't be a more generic place if it had been designed to be. At the end of a ridiculously long hallway, a guard requested the pass and, after inserting it into the reader, demanded his ID. A call a few close stares, a couple of questions about who he had come to see and who had given him the pass seemed to reassure her. Awfully tight security for an interview. Understanding hit him about the time he punched the elevator button. The layout of a secret service building would probably be valuable information on some market or another, and he thought the military had written the manual on security. A woman stood inside the doorway of one of the offices, likely the woman who would decide his fate. Would he become a Secret Service agent? From all he'd been told, he'd know by the end of the day. She couldn't be more than five foot two, although her obscene heels hinted at closer to five five. Probably a hundred pounds in winter, wearing full ski gear. And a bowling ball. Dark wavy hair and equally dark eyes. Indian, for sure. She had that exotic, aristocratic look that some Indian women managed without even trying. Beautiful? An understatement. Her hand thrust out to grasp his, and in the span of a single shake, Keith revised his assessment. She might be as much as a hundred and ten, sans bowling ball even. The woman was strong. No, she didn't squeeze the life from his hand, but he'd learned to gauge a person's strength from the way she gripped or the way he moved. Every move this woman made told a story, and every one of them impressed him. Could he take her in a fight? Most likely. He had almost a hundred pounds on her for one thing. Could she do some serious damage before he took her out? Most likely. If he were caught off guard? Certainly. Hani Kur, you're... Interesting. She didn't make assumptions. Just as he introduced himself, Keith realized... The interview had already begun. Keith Auger. Nice to meet you. Please, have a seat. The office, though on the small side, felt open. The desk that housed a computer monitor and desk pad was narrower than most. Then he saw it. A lift. 
It had hydraulics to make it a standing desk. That's probably why the chair had been moved aside. In front of that desk sat two smallish armchairs, round-backed. Probably crazy comfy for her. They'd kill his lumbar region in another ten years, at best. It seemed ridiculous, but Keith hesitated between the two chairs for half a second before deciding to ask. Do you have a preference for which chair I sit in? Either is fine. You're overthinking this, Augur. When she seated herself in the chair opposite, Keith's throat began to constrict. Something about this didn't feel right. What was she doing? Without preamble, Miss Cor reached for an iPad and began flicking across the screen. All his friends had said those iPad things wouldn't catch on. Clearly they had here. You have an impressive service record, Mr. Auger. How did he respond to that? Implying he didn't would be dishonest, not to mention a great way to hint that someone else might be a better fit. But... A glance at her showed he'd taken too much thinking time already. No more than a lot of guys. We did our jobs. Some of us were put in situations that required more from us than others faced. Had they been in our shoes? He let the thought lay there and hoped for the best. Those eyes widened just a bit. Surprise? Disbelief? It wasn't disgust. That one he'd have been able to detect. Your... A buzzing sound stopped her. She stared at the floor, rising from her seat as she did. After half a second, she pulled her weapon from a back holster and pointed for him to get behind the desk, despite it being useless as a barrier. He'd have protested, but the look she gave him prompted obedience against every instinct in his body. She's your commanding officer right now. You listen. It's probably a test. The door opened just as she reached for it. One second, he peered over the desktop, ready to spring into action, and the next, a stinging gas filled his eyes and lungs. He coughed, sputtered, and squeezed his eyes shut before vaulting the desk and bolting from the room. Half a second later, he jumped back inside as a couple of wild shots rang out in the hallway. A second look showed an empty hall. Keith, coughing again, took a look both ways and saw exit signs at each end of the hall. Perspiration dampened his armpits as he bolted for the one closest to the rear of the building. Even if they'd taken the elevator, they'd have to go out the back. No one would try to drag a woman out of the front of the Rockland Secret Service field office in broad daylight. The door to the stairwell took too long to reach. Ten seconds? It should have been five. He didn't have any seconds to waste if they used the elevator. Just as he reached for the handle, Keith hesitated and glanced around. No fire extinguisher. Great. There went that plan. He dashed into the stairwell and made it down two steps before the red extinguisher registered in his brain. He backtracked, ripped it off the wall, and took the steps two and three at a time. In movies, the hero would have jumped over corners to get down faster, but he'd never done it. Breaking an ankle wouldn't end this nightmare, but it could prevent him from stopping it. Just as he passed the second floor, his footfalls echoing in the stairwell, he heard fumbling and stomping above him. A glance back told him he'd better hurry. They'd gotten off the elevator before the lobby. Smart move. If he'd had time to sit and ponder like a villain in some superhero movie, Keith would likely have allowed himself half a second of a diabolical grin. As it was, he barely got the door shut and himself in position before he heard them coming. He'd read it in a book once. Well, actually, his mom had played the audio CD on a long car trip to the Grand Canyon when he was 15, but he remembered it well. An old lady spy at a compound in Italy and karate chops to the neck, one invader at a time. With the extinguisher in one hand, ready to brain the guy, and his other hand ready to jerk the jerk out of the way, Keith waited. Please don't let them push her out first. He'd do it, conk her over the head with it if she happened to appear first. There wouldn't be time to prevent it, but she'd end up with a concussion. Still, better that than kidnapped. The door pulled open one centimeter at a time. The guy looked left first and stepped forward just a bit more as his head turned. Their gazes met, but before the guy could call out a warning, Keith slammed the fire extinguisher down on his head and jerked him out of the way. A new thought hit him just as the door pushed open further. The next one would be Miss Cor. Great. But it was too late. 
He pulled his blow as much as possible, but she dropped to the ground with the same sickening crack of the head as the last guy. Should have dropped her on him. Footfalls on the stairs told him the other guy had taken off. Keith didn't have time to waste. He hoisted the unconscious woman over his shoulder in a fireman's hold and rushed for the back entrance. Someone called for him to stop, but since he didn't know who that was, he kept going. He'd get her far away, make sure they weren't followed, and take her to an urgent care, maybe in one of the little towns around the loop. Too bad he didn't know where they were, how to get there, and which ones had decent medical care. As he slid her into the back seat of his 39 Packard, Keith winced at her goose egg. So much for that job. Hani groaned, opened her eyes, and at the sight of a world that seemed distorted by a psychedelic filter, closed them again. A voice, a familiarish one, said, Did I see you move your eyelids? The recruit. He'd gotten her out. Impressive. Yes. As much as she hated to admit it, even to herself, saying more than that would probably make her moan. Never show weakness, especially when you're half the size of your target. The car lurched left and accelerated, only to come to a near stop a moment later. A peek left showed the man clenching his jaw and gripping the steering wheel while attempting to bore holes in the rearview mirror with laser vision or something. Are they behind us? When the light changed, he shot forward and around a car, passing on the right. Impressive. She hadn't thought he'd do that. A moment later, she slammed into his seat. Might want to buckle up. I didn't have time. Never would have guessed. Hani wouldn't have smiled exactly, but feeling her sarcastic side emerge told her she'd be okay. Why does my head hurt? Conked you with a fire extinguisher. He glanced at her in the rearview mirror before adding, Sorry, I tried to pull it when I realized they'd push you out next, but it was too late. And where are we? Hani couldn't look out the window. That still did wonky things to her vision and her equilibrium. No clue. Don't know the city. So far I've managed to evade these guys three times, but they always find me again. I kind of have a conspicuous car. That's when she saw it. Wood trim by her hand hinted at a car from the forties or fifties. Why hadn't she known what he drove? Hani squeezed her eyes in an attempt to clear them. He's been driving a rental. Didn't we look to see if he owned a vehicle? She thought they had. Why couldn't she remember? I decided I needed to get us out of the city, but every time I get near an on-ramp, I see something that makes me think we're being followed. This time he shot into a parking lot. No, easy to get boxed in. But he didn't. He managed to squeeze between two vans and wait. I think I lost them before I turned in here. The guy, what was his name, turned to look at her. Can you look at me? I th think you'll probably have a concussion. Even as he peered into her eyes, his hands fumbled in the glove compartment of a car built when women probably still wore gloves to church on Sundays. He pulled a Garmin from within and plugged it into a cigarette lighter, all without taking his eyes off hers. Hani eventually closed them, needing a steadying moment. Yep, concussion. Sorry. This is good, though. I didn't trust myself to stop driving long enough to try to get my GPS going. He sounded truly apologetic. Interesting. That went on a mental inventory. How will a GPS help you evade these guys? It won't, but it'll help me figure out where I am and am going once I do. Good. Someone climbed into the van to Hani's right, and the man scowled. Wasn't ready to take off yet, but here goes. Before he could put the car in reverse, she climbed over the seat and pulled the buckle tight around her. Her stomach clenched, head swam, and her eyes... Well, if they ever worked right again, she'd be grateful. Three empty spaces appeared when the van backed out and drove away. Her rescuer, she really needed to remember his name, or ask, backed out as well, took off around the back of the building and flung the car into reverse as he reached the corner. I don't think they saw me, but there's a car just sitting there. No idea if it's them or not, 
but not risking it. How do you see them? Tires squealed as Keith missed a hatchback by mere centimeters. Gas tanker to the right, reflective. The car swung around and the driver of the hatchback flung a rude gesture at them and screamed obscenities as they passed. He's not happy. Hani snickered. She couldn't help it. Back on the streets, she tried to get her bearing, but he changed directions wildly. Someone needed to teach him evasion tactics. As he veered around one corner, sped through an alley, and went right back on the road he'd been driving down, she held on tight. He might just get away with it. Their pursuers would expect someone with skills and try to predict moves based on prior ones. No one could predict this guy. He drove like a taxi driver in a bad movie. Skilled and scary. Throbbing above and to the left of her right temple sent her hand fumbling and prompted a gasp of pain when fingers made contact. Her self-appointed chauffeur hissed a, Sorry. He broke off what else he might have said and began watching the rearview mirror in earnest. Might be a different car now, or a citizen. It's hard to tell. How many are there? What do they want? Don't know. Something in her tone must have fired off alarm bells, because he slammed on his brakes at a yellow light and stared at her as cars screeched to stops behind him. Okay, do you know how to get out of the city without using the loop? She did, didn't she? With pain still shooting through her, Hani closed her eyes and said, Don't get off city streets until you know you've lost them. It's harder to take someone out in a crowded area. Good point. After a second glance at her, he shot through the light half a second before it turned red. A car that had tried to gun it through a yellow screeched and swerved, nearly colliding with a median. Hani's head slammed into the window when he swerved to avoid a car pulling out into traffic and saw red, then white, before blackness consumed her again. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.